Um, I want to begin by thanking two of the co-sponsors of the event, um, Airwags, the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and especially Shannon Peter and her staff here at the Basel Process for graciously hosting this event and making many, many of the arrangements that uh, made it possible. Um, and this is also the first event of a new operation in Columbia, sort of information, the Columbia Research Initiative on the Global History of Sexualities, uh, which I direct. And since this is our first event, I wanted to say a couple of words about what we're hoping to do. The CRI is designed to foster research on the history of sexualities at Columbia, in part by organizing public events such as this, uh, convening working groups on the history of sexualities, and providing support for teaching and research on this history here at Columbia. Uh, we'll do the latter in part by I mean, a variety of ways to provide concrete support to graduate students who are engaged in this research and support to other faculty and scholars from outside Columbia who are teaching and writing in this area. So to that end, one of the first things that we're doing, um, a project that I expect to go online next semester, is preparing a guide to resources on the history of sexuality here at Columbia and the various libraries, which range from a really quite astonishing number of collections of papers of mostly queer writers, cartoonists, filmmakers, and other cultural workers, um, to the papers of sociologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and public health professionals who did research on questions of sexuality, which are held in various libraries here, to the papers of some of the major social service agencies and anti-vice societies based in New York that were established mostly in the late 19th, early 20th centuries in order to police or regulate sexuality in communities of color and other working class and immigrant neighborhoods. I've actually been, I just came here from Yale where we had an incredible collection and I've been really thrilled to discover that we probably have an even greater range of resources here at Columbia. We also anticipate organizing over the next couple of years a series of small working groups that will encourage fellows to think about various questions in the history of sexuality from a transnational comparative lens rather than the uh, narrowly national, single national lens that's governed most work in history of sexualities. Um, I'm already working with a colleague at Oxford, a Soviet historian, organizing a series of small uh, workshops on current manifestations and historical backdrop to anti-gay politics of the former Soviet republics. We expect to do more of that in the next few years, so stay tuned. So it's in this spirit, and in the spirit of analyzing the conditions of possibility for our own work as scholars and citizens, that we're very grateful to have Eric Hassan here today to address both the growing political challenges to scholarship and gender and sexuality studies, and the dangerously exclusionary ways in which certain kinds of sexual liberalism to which the scholarship has often contributed can be used. And I have to say that for me, this talk feels even more urgent today than when we organized it, which was not very long ago, given the dangerous and deeply disturbing developments of just recently, from Brazil's election of a far-right president who announces homosexuals, gender queers, women, black criminals, and the theory of gender, the dangerous outside of stimulation, to the decertification of gender studies programs by the right-wing government in Hungary, to Republicans increasingly violent targeting, targeting of immigrants, Muslims, people of color, transgender people, and wealthy, cosmopolitan, and by the way, Jewish, in the select like George Soros in its midterm election year. So I feel like President Hustle's talk could not be more timely or urgent. Um, and in a moment, Professor Okami Rossi will introduce Professor Hassan. But before she does so, I just want to say how much I have benefited over the years from his scholarship and his friendship, and how much I have admired his acting as a public and an intellectual in very contentious debates in France, often at significant professional risk to himself, and indeed with significant professional, professional consequences for himself. For some 20 years now, he has been an important voice in France, drawing attention to the problem of sexual harassment and assault in French academic circles, in support of the fledgling project of creating LGBTQ studies in France, 
and in challenging the work of his fellow social scientists, which try to shore up a heteronormative definition of marriage. And most recently, he's played a leadership role in the two issues that he will address today. First, and most recently, on the question of anti-gender politics, by co-organizing an international network of scholars to defend gender studies programs where they're under attack across the world, which is quite a few places. And second, on the question of sexual democracy, by playing a leading role in organizing the conference in 2010 at the University of Amsterdam on sexual nationalism and the politics of belonging in Europe, which inevitably became a very contentious event, uh, but one which constituted a major intervention against the growing use of sexual liberalism to exclude various groups of immigrants, and above all Muslims, from the definition of Europe. Doing this took a lot of time and courage, and I'm grateful to him for that. Now, to say more about Professor Hassan, let me introduce my colleague, Kendi Rossi, who's arrived at Columbia even more recently than I have, just this fall, after teaching for the last 10 years at Cornell, but who is already having an outsized impact on multiple conversations here. She's an associate professor of French and history, and is best known for her book, The Law of Kinship, Anthropology, Psychoanalysis, and the Family in France, which was published in 2013 by Cornell University Press, and won that year's Berkshire Conference of Women's Historians Book Prize. It examines how and why French judges and legislators turned to structuralism, and particularly some of the more difficult and abstract concepts of Lavi Strauss and Lacan, and I have to say as a somewhat more than casual but not serious person following the French debates over marriage, I was always amazed that they were quoting Lucas Strauss and Lacan instead of the Bible, which I was accustomed to in the United States. She's helped to explain how this happened and how this was used to reassert the centrality of our sexual family and political debates around same-sex marriage, bioethics, single-parent households, and adoption. She's also published on the history of psychotherapy in France and the Catholic opposition to same-sex marriage and gender theory. And she's currently teaching a very exciting graduate course on gender theory. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, George, for this really kind introduction. And I, so I was just going to say a few words about Eric and then uh, let him have the microphone. Uh, but I'm really thrilled to, to be introducing Eric Hassan today. Um, Eric was trained as a sociologist, but he really is a truly interdisciplinary scholar who has engaged anthropology, literature, political science, queer and feminist theory, law, psychoanalysis, and, and even theology, actually. Um, in general terms, we can say that his work focuses on contemporary sexual and racial politics in France and in the United States, uh, and in the intersections of these two fields. Um, and as George said, it, this is really a kind of a, a history of actualité, a kind of history of the present, if you want, in the in kind of the Michel Foucault tradition, uh, a, a history that is interested in the operations of power and in understanding how norms have been constructed historically. Um, and very often, again, as George said, his work has gone hand in hand with a very active form of political activism, whether it be in the case of gay marriage, uh, around the question of gender parity in France, or in questions of immigration. Um, since 2012, Eric has been teaching at the Department of Political Science and in the Gender Studies program at the University of Paris 8. Um, and uh, before that, he taught 18 years at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris and seven years uh, in the U.S. at Brandeis at NYU. Um, and so, as I said, Eric has written on a wide range of issues, but I'll just mention three, three kind of broad interests of his. Um, the first one has been politics, generally speaking. Uh, so more recently, he just wrote a book on populism, which I think he's going to translate into English soon. It's scheduled to be translated in French. It's called Populisme, le grand ressentiment, in 2017. And before that, a book on the French left called Gauche, l'avenir d'une désillusion. Uh, and so several chronicles on the kind of government, on, on the different governments that France has had. The second broad interest of his has been immigration. 
And, and this has led him to um, write a book on, the, on Europe's treatments of, of Roma called Robe uh, et looking at municipal policies around the question of, 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 of handling of immigration at the municipal level. Um, and to also participate in a collective called Cette France-là, which basically examined Nicolas Sarkozy's um, immigration policies and audited them, basically, for, uh, and published those results. And finally, the last big theme that he's been very interested in and, and has published a lot on has been gender and sexuality. In some ways, his first interest, but uh, that has been a constant um, in his work, from books such as The Inversion of the Homosexual Question in 2008 to The Political Sex, Gender and Sexuality in the Transatlantic Mirror, where he compares the US and France uh, to men and women, uh, what, what is the difference, which is a conversation with a theologian uh, trying to understand sexual difference. Um, so in this context, as, as, as George mentioned, he's the co-founder of, of a gender international and an academic network in defense of gender studies that has been under attack in so many places in the world. So I think that's what he's going to talk to us a little bit about this today, so I will um, let him give him the floor, but please join me in welcoming Eric Hassan back to Colombia. wonderful to come to a place where people introduce you because you feel very good about yourself for about one minute and then you start talking. <laughs> um, and it's very cool to see many people whom I've known for many years, starting with uh, Shani Peer, uh, the director of the Maison Français, but many others in this room. And so uh, thank you very much for being present. Um, I will say something first about the title of my talk, Threatening Gender, which plays on the <coughs> possibility in the English language to have two meanings that is threatened and threatening um, in, in gender. And, and the reason why there's this uh, double meaning is because it's part of a conversation that I and others have been having with colleagues from Brazil uh, for a few years and that we hope to continue circumstances notwithstanding uh, and, and which was organized with events entitled in French and I will not try the Brazilians because the Brazilian version because they, they have enough problems as it is. Uh, and and the, the it's called Jean Menaçant, Jean Menacé. The reason why I mention that is because I think that this which I'm going to be presenting is not just about me, it's about all kinds of people uh, who've been working on these issues, and it's not just about France, it's about France, but also about many other countries. And in many ways, I feel that whatever argument I'm presenting is part of a continuing story. Um, can be rightly uh, pointed out that I insist on speaking about actuality, that is about the presentness of the present, the historicity of the present, uh, but at the same time, uh, as years go by, this presentness has more and more history. Uh, and and uh, so there, there's a system of echoes when we're talking uh, tonight, I'm also thinking about other interventions, including, for example, uh, what happened a few months ago in Verona, uh, and which I will be referring to later. Uh, but in Verona, there was an event, a conference organized by a former student, uh, an Italian student, Massimo uh, Preauro, and, and uh, it was about um, gay asylum or LGBT asylum. Um, and, and it was uh, banned by the university under pressure from the far right. Um, what was interesting is that this was even before the far right came to power. Uh, and, and so it reflected the climate. And, and we had to mobilize internationally, as George started mentioning, I will return to this at the end. And in that case, it worked. But so all these arguments that I'm trying to make do not come from abstract uh, reflection about what's going on, but trying to make sense of working with people in different countries uh, who have been confronted with uh, difficulties, starting with my own experience working in France, but also trying to uh, have it resonate with that of others. And so I think something that is going on has to do both with my own Frenchness, so to speak, or with my being involved in this transatlantic mirror that I've been working on for 
many years. Uh, and, and, but it also has to do with uh, all this internationalization of gender politics. So that's, that's the general context, and now I, I'd like to, to present the argument. The first thing that I would say is that when I started teaching in France in 1994, after a few years in the US, I realized that teaching about gender meant that you were confronted with, at best, indifference, and also condescendence. Uh, that is basically, it was, how shall I put it, not very manly. Uh, and and um, I was saved uh, from this um, terrible uh, suspicion of unmanliness by the fact that I worked in the US. And so since people are interested in the US, at least, I mean, that made sense. But, but I want to insist on that because I think many of us, in particular uh, women, uh, who are working in gender studies in France still very much remember that moment when it was difficult to talk about all this because everyone thought they was not interested. So indifference, uh, condescension, uh, and, and ridicule were very much part of the story. And again, I'm not the one who experienced it most, partly because I'm a man. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's an element that I want to recall. One consequence is that it has been difficult to take seriously the fact that gender is taken seriously. Uh, and that, I think, has been an important shift that we have to fully take into account. The fact that we do not need to convince people that gender matters any longer. Because, in fact, there's a constant discussion about gender. This, I think, is what has happened in my professional lifetime. Not that I'm directly responsible for this evolution, uh, but, but I think that's the point that I want to start from. The fact that no one today ignores in France, even in France, ignores the word gender. Everyone knows the word gender. People have stopped generally using it in English. They started using it in French. Uh, the fact that they're using it in absurd ways is a good sign of the fact that now it's part of the common vocabulary. So it's a complete shift from some obscure field of knowledge to something that is not a political issue that everyone has something to say about. Of course, it's not always a good thing, and there are many downsides to this, but I want to start from this shift. Um, if we think of this, um, it, for me, it has been part of my trying to speak about gender and sexuality and more generally minority issues, including racial issues, but let's focus on gender for the moment. It has been part of this attempt at introducing, uh, at contributing to introducing, along with others, a vocabulary that was supposed to be alien to France, that was supposed to be uh, un-French, uh, hence the importance of the reference to the US. Now, um, my one element, one concept that I have used in this work is the concept that I have tried to develop over the last 15 years or 20 years, of that of sexual democracy. I will explain why it has a historical context and, and how it can function. Um, it was in the context of the battles in France about the Pax, that is the, the early version of gay marriage, um, that um, it seemed to me there was one question that had to be addressed, how come people cared so much about gay marriage? Um, I've always felt that on the one hand, there aren't that many gays and lesbians. And second, many gays and lesbians don't want to get married. So how come it became a national discussion? So instead of assuming that of course it should be central, uh, and I have some interest in thinking that it's central because I'm working on these issues and I'm uh, publicly involved, in, in these issues, but at the same time, my main concern has been, who cares? How come people care so much about this? And, and hence the, the notion or the concept of sexual democracy. Let me explain this, and, and I will, at the end of my presentation, I will return to this uh, with a different take on the word democracy. But for the moment, let's say that I use now the term democracy in the sense of uh, societies that claim to define themselves. Uh, instead of being defined by a transcendent principle, which can be the Bible or the Strauss, or as, as George was saying, or uh, any other reference, well, societies claim to define themselves in an imminent 
way from the inside. We define society, that is, we define norms, laws. That's the definition of democracy, which I think I probably largely borrowed without being aware of it, or, or at least without paying attention to it, to uh, Castoriadis uh, and his work on the auto institution imaginaire de la société. But in a way, my, my point is not to trace a genealogy of this, but it's to insist on something which has to do with the historicity of the concept. For me, what is useful about this concept is that it helps think historically about what is going on. That is, about the extension of the logic of democracy to sexual issues. That is, instead of saying that, sure, everything is democratic, that is, everything is up to us, but not everything, and the not everything usually has to do with the body, and it has to do with sex, uh, and it has to do with sexuality, that we cannot uh, define uh, what a man is, what a woman is, because it's given. It's not something that we make, it's something that is given to us. Or we cannot define what a family is or what marriage is because there are transcendent definitions of, of man, woman, family, marriage, etc. etc. So instead of thinking uh, in those terms, I think what has happened is that once the democratic logic, that is, we define the world in which we live, uh, starts prevailing, then it can apply also, uh, potentially, to gender and sexuality, to the sexual order, to marriage, to the family, to the definition of man, woman, etc. It doesn't mean, of course, that this is how it works. Uh, what it means is that there are battles about this. Uh, it doesn't mean that today we define the world that we live in, first because we has to be defined. And as we know, we means excluding all kinds of people from who defines. Uh, hence the battle about redefining the we. <coughs> but second, uh, I don't need to say that today we live in a society where everyone has accepted that we define the world in which we live. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all these battles in the streets of France about gay marriage or in other countries about uh, all kinds of issues from, from abortion to sexual harassment, etc. So if we have uh, these battles, if we have, uh, for example, Donald Trump uh, today who says he wants uh, to, or his administration uh, wants to redefine uh, sex to basically make sure that it goes back to sort of good old traditional definition, binary and immutable. So if we have all this, it doesn't mean that basically we're still in the old world because in fact it becomes a political battle. What I think is very important is to understand that today those who say I'm against what I call sexual democracy, uh, they're not outside of sexual democracy. They are part of sexual democracy. For me, the Vatican today is very much part of sexual democracy even though the Vatican is constantly criticizing sexual democracy. Why? Because the Vatican is participating in a debate, in a conflict, in polemics about gender and sexuality. In some ways, uh, the, the text that was published uh, many years ago, in 2004, about the Vatican and the collaboration of men and women in the church and in the world, uh, this uh, text written by Ratzinger uh, showed that basically uh, the man who was going to become the Pope uh, was debating with Judith Butler. Uh, that is what I call sexual democracy. Not the fact that everyone agrees on liberty and equality, but the fact that people are fighting about it, which means there's no transcendent definition. If it were transcendent, there would be no argument with Judith Butler from the Pope. I think the Pope has sort of made clear that he, the Popes uh, have made clear that they're part of a debate on all this. It's one position among others, an interesting one, and one that can claim some authority, but Judith Butler does have some authority as well. It's also an interesting position. That's how sexual democracy works. It's not freedom and equality for all, it's the politicization of the world. And this is where I want to, to point out um, what I mean by the historical nature of this concept of sexual democracy. Um, when we think about history and gender, uh, the most readily available model is 
the Whiggish model, that of progress, a sort of liberal model of progress. And as we'll see, what is complicated about this is that it can be used and instrumentalized uh, in ways that discredit others who are supposed to be archaic. That's one option. There's a second option to think historically about gender, uh, which is also often used implicitly or explicitly. It's thinking about gender as uh, this sort of eternal repetition of masculine domination. And in some ways, this is what you find in some of the scholarly work. If you look at François Héritier, on the one hand, if you look at Pierre Bourdieu, on the other, in masculine domination, basically what they're pointing out is the fact that it's more or less the same thing over and over again. So you have two opposite models, one that says progress and one that says repetition, the eternal repetition. I think, um, the reason why I find talking about sexual democracy useful is that it introduces history without having a sort of uh, Whiggish model. And let me explain that. Um, it's not a model about progress because, in fact, the difference between the liberal definition of democracy and the definition that I'm using is that the content of democracy is not predefined. It is what is at stake in these battles. For example, when we're talking about liberty and equality, um, we're not in agreement about what it means. Think about the debates about sex work or about prostitution. Think about the debates and the polemics about the so-called Islamic veil. In both cases, you have both sides speaking in the name of democratic values. That is, it's always in the name of women's liberty and of equality between the sexes, whether you're pro or against, whether talking about the Islamic veil or prostitution. In all cases, everyone is using a democratic language to say, oh, there are absolute reasons to be on one side or the other. Now, that to me is important because it means that defining what liberty and equality mean uh, is precisely what politics is about. It's not as if we knew in advance what it means. It's not as if we had the side of democracy versus the side of the absence of democracy. I think we had at the same time battles uh, about what it means, uh, what democracy means. In that sense, there's no sort of preordained definition, um, which would be a sort of teleological uh, definition of, of um, sexual democracy. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to move on to once this concept has been developed, how it can be used. And how it can be used is not just how I can use it or how hopefully colleagues might use it, but how society uses it. And that's one point that in my work, and I'm not the only one, but I want to emphasize is that basically the kind of categories, vocabularies, concepts that we use are not just used by academics. In fact, we're using more or less either vocabulary that pre-exists or we're forging a new vocabulary that might actually be used by others. This is true of gender. Uh, gender is not just used by people in gender studies. Even La Manifourte was using the word gender. Uh, they were saying, pas touche à les stéréotypes de genre. Don't you dare touch our gender stereotypes. So they were indeed using the word gender, and they had the concept of gender uh, implicit in their own work. They were anti-gender in the same way that people can be anti-sexual democracy, but by using the same logic, which is the politicization of all this. Now, if we think uh, of this now, I, I want to uh, emphasize how it can be used by societies in ways that were unintended, un the unintended appropriations of gender and of sexual democracy. This has always been true, but I want to discuss what has happened, uh, in, in, and this was mentioned in the introduction, uh, in all the debates about so-called sexual nationalisms, or gay imperialism, or homo nationalism, or federal nationalism, all these words that have been forged in different contexts with variations and with different theoretical models, and there are many others. But I think all these words have to do with the co-optation of liberal logics, uh, of progressive logics, 
called sexual democratic uh, logics uh, for purposes that can be racist and xenophobic. Uh, this, I think, is familiar to, to many, and, and I will present it briefly. What has happened is that, on the one hand, those of us who are talking about sexual democracy were feel, as I did, felt that basically it was something that was a critical instrument, an instrument to, to sort of uh, make norms visible instead of them being invisible. That, I think, was the, the bottom line. However, this critical version could easily transform into a normative version. That is, once you start talking about sexual democracy, you can see the ambiguity. On the one hand, it's a critical tool, but it also, at the same time, sort of implies an ideal. And so that's the ambiguity of the concept that I find useful, precisely because it can be uh, sort of, uh, appropriated, co-opted by people who will use it for racist and xenophobic purposes. This is something that I, like also many others, have worked on for many years, for example, in immigration policies in Europe. Uh, immigration policies in Europe have been, in the years 2000, uh, very much developed around the idea of sexual democracy, with the idea that was, for example, uh, central in the Netherlands, uh, of the idea that, uh, and this is why this conference on sexual nationalisms took place in Amsterdam, which I thought was the capital city of sexual nationalisms. Uh, and, and, uh, why? Because in fact, uh, it was easy to show that we embody progress, we embody tolerance, and we embody uh, sexual freedom and equality between the sexes, and they don't. And since we want to maintain our democratic model, we have to sort of leave out those who are not accepted as a common shared model. So this is uh, what happened in the Netherlands, but it happened in many countries. Of course, we could argue that it doesn't mean that in practice uh, the Netherlands was perfectly free from homophobia and sexism, etc., no more than France, and etc. Obviously, but what, what I want to point out is the rhetoric that has been used, and this has been a rhetoric uh, that focuses on the idea of us versus them. This appropriation of the rhetoric of sexual democracy is used to, to delineate borders between us and them. That's what it does. Uh, it's used as a way of sort of differentiating between two categories of people, those that are modern on the side of sexual democracy, and those that are archaic, that are not. The difficulty, of course, has been for those of us who were interested in fighting for more liberty and more equality, how not to fall into the trap of uh, being just co-opted in the same way and appropriated in the same way. And I think this has been one of the defining features of the years uh, 2000. How can people talk about rights, for example, and not be instrumentalized by those who want to point out that we need to civilize others who have no rights or not enough rights compared to us, etc. This is familiar to, to many. Uh, for me, one of the revelations was not just in the Netherlands, but also uh, in France with uh, former President Nicolas Sarkozy, who um, discovered that nat national identity could be a good way to win the elections in 2007, uh, at a time when the National Front uh, could be uh, a rival to the right, and, and so he decided that national identity was the way to win. And it did work in 2007, but the way he justified national identity at a time when many on the left criticized this uh, uh, way of mobilizing national identity in opposition to immigration. He said, of course, it has nothing to do with race and ethnicity. It has everything to do with fundamental values that are democratic values. And the one value that he took as an example is the fact that in France, women are free. Uh, and, and free as a principle, that is, they're free to marry, they're free to get a divorce, they're free, even, and I always point this out because I think it's so important, he insisted that in France, women are free to have an abortion. Now, it was quite interesting for a right-wing candidate, and it was quite interesting that no one noticed, even though it was repeated all the time during the campaign. Um, what it showed is that basically people are willing to sort of reorganize their world views when it's convenient because basically the point was to draw a line between us and them and never mind that basically the others who tended to be Muslims uh, didn't speak so much about abortion, probably much less than Catholics. And, and so it didn't 
matter in any way. It didn't matter that the right uh, had um, vilified Simon Weil uh, in, in the middle years of, in, in the mid 70s. It didn't matter. And actually, Simon Weil became the spokesperson for, um, for Nicolas Sarkozy in his campaign in 2007. So that's one example, but you can find that throughout Europe, and I don't want to insist on this too much, because I think it's familiar to, to many of you. It's just a reminder uh, of the fact that uh, sexual democracy can be turned around. And so you have to be careful when you talk about sexual democracy, not just of people who don't like you, but also of people who like you. Uh, that's one of the problems in gender studies that you're never having. Uh, that is, either people like you and it's dreadful, or they don't and it's dreadful. <laughs> and, and I think that's fundamental, that is, the suspicion that oh, whatever you do can be used in ways that you do not control. And, and, and I think that's one of the critical aspects of, of gender studies. Now, I will suggest that in many ways, all of this moment is over. But of course, things are never over. If you look, so to qualify my statement about this being over, Oh, I, I would refer to all the discussion that took place about Cologne and the uh, sexual attacks in Cologne that were very much formulated in the same terms. That is, they are sexually arcane, barbaric, etc. And that's why they do what they do. Um, of course, as we know, uh, and from the campaign on, on Me Too, etc., Apparently, it's not just Muslims, and it's not just Africans, and apparently it can be Europeans, and it can be white people, it can be upper class people, and all that. So, of course, it's more complicated, and that's why rhetoric matters. Rhetoric is about making things simple. Political rhetoric. Um, now, if we um, want to see how this discourse, in some ways, became obsolete up to a point, even though I have qualified this already, I, I still want to insist on the fact that it's less central today. We have to look um, at a TV show that was quite interesting uh, a few years ago during the battle about gay marriage, uh, when you had Frédéric uh, Paddy, a television personality, who invited a series of people to participate in a discussion about gay marriage, and he had far-right uh, opponents of gay marriage, such as Paul Maïto, uh, and he had also uh, who's basically on the right of the National Front, uh, but he also had, on the right, I um, and he also had uh, Frigide Barjot, who is the leader of the Manif who was a more fun boy, who's in Persian, and all this, and, and uh, there was also, among the people who were there, uh, there was also Guillaume de Job, uh, the, the spokesperson for the movement of the anti gender League that has since become the Parti des anti gender League. A radical, decolonial, or post-colonial, or anti-colonial uh, movement uh, in France. What was interesting is that, in some ways, all the arguments that she used had to do with the kind of critique uh, in that discussion, with the kind of critique uh, that goes under the name of gay imperialism, or that goes under the name of homo-nationalism. And she actually used those terms, and when she said homo-nationalism, she said, I prefer to call it homo-racialism. So, insisting on, on this dimension. Now, what is interesting is that in some ways she said, people in the Bondue have nothing to do with this uh, sort of uh, white gay uh, demand for rights, and, and so it's not our problem, we have other problems. But it became not just a question of indifference, but also a question of hostility, because she developed the argument about gay imperialism, etc., that is imposing the norm of gayness uh, that is supposed to be Western or white, or etc. What was interesting is that this argument, uh, which I have been uh, interested in for, for many years, sounded quite different all of a sudden in the context of the debate on gay marriage. And this is part of my general approach to this, context matters. That is, the same arguments can end up meaning something quite different in a different context. And the reason why it was quite different is because of all the mobilizations against gay marriage. All the mobilizations, and we had sitting next to her, and we had Fushin Bato, and they both applauded what she was saying. And so she had to say, but I'm not on the same side. I'm not on the far right. That, to me, proved that all of a sudden, the world had changed. 
and that she had developed an argument that was central in the debates of the years 2000, but that became much more complicated when the people who were demonstrating in the streets were not Arabs, they were not blacks, although they were not working class. They were upper middle class white people from all Versailles and other places. They were not the, the people we had been told for years were homophobic. They were not the people from Saint Saint-Denis, or from Saint-Denis itself, where I teach. Uh, Paris 8, where you have more working class, more non-white, uh, more uh, Muslim uh, populations. They were not in the streets. They were not mobilizing. So it implied a complete change of perspective. That is, you couldn't just say, oh, it's always this gay curious thing, when, in fact, the, the homophobia came from whites. That is, instead of saying what we'd heard in the years 2000, that is, homophobia and sexism are about them, not about us, what the far right is saying, it's about us. We are defined by whiteness, but also by sexism and by homophobia. And this is not totally alien to people who live in the US, I think. Uh, I think you've heard that in the last few years. And this is in no way alien to people who live in Brazil today. It's the same story. So instead of thinking that sexism and homophobia are about others, it became about us. At least this is the dominant discourse that emerged and became very difficult to recycle the discourse about the homonationalism and gay imperialism in this context. When you have Christian Babu <coughs> next to you, it's difficult uh, to have a discussion. There was discussion within the left. But once it becomes a conversation with the right that plays a prominent role, it complicates the issue. Because there was one element in the years 2000 that had been largely unnoticed in gender studies and that gained more importance in the last few years. Uh, and that has been the Catholic version of anti-gender politics, and more generally the Christian version of anti-gender politics. I had been interested in this in part because I had encountered it uh, at the end of the 1990s uh, with the Pax debate, and I started teaching my seminar where most people were taken back. Uh, I started teaching uh, the texts produced by the Vatican, and, and the, the, the audience were somewhat puzzled by this sort of perverse interest in Catholic theology that was mentioned to my shame uh, before. Um, so it, it was um, interesting because, in fact, it seemed archaic. It seemed to belong to a world of the past. And so, again, you had people, the, the same people who had sort of smeared about gender 10 years before, in the years 2000, they smeared about the Catholic Church. Even though the Catholic Church was saying exactly the same thing that you'd heard from conservative progressives against the facts of five years before. The Vatican, as you know, started realizing that gender was a problem in the mid-1990s. Uh, there was, uh, in particular, the Beijing Conference, uh, the International UN Conference uh, on, on Women, uh, where the, the concept of gender became a central issue and a dividing issue. And in particular, you had someone like Bill O'Leary, and it has been studied by quite a few people, um, the, who's pointed out the risk, and that's when Judith Butler became the sort of arch enemy, and Anne Foster Sterling too, um, but in a sort of minor way, as a sort of archbishop compared to the Pope uh, in this hierarchy. Uh, so the, the interest of, of the Catholic Church in this was quite interesting, because in fact, when you look at the way gender was introduced in international organizations, it was just about gender. It was not about sexuality. Uh, sexuality was left out. What the Catholic Church did is say, no, no, gender is about sexuality at the same time. The Catholic Church didn't invent that, because in fact it was already at the center of anti-feminist arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment in the US, uh, where you had the idea that uh, Phyllis Schlafly, for example, uh, pointed out from the start that one of the problems with the Equal Rights Amendment was that women would be fighting uh, in wars, a uh, second problem would be uh, unisex bathrooms, and the third problem would be gay marriage. 
that was the, the 1970s. So quite interesting, because we can see that we're still in the same world and the same preoccupations. And, and what it shows is that the Catholic Church didn't invent it, but it put it at the center of discussions. That is, from the start, the Catholic Church said, if you start having gender, you'll end up having gay marriage. This is what they say from the start. That is, basically, once you start saying that gender is socially constructed or something like that, well, you'll end up saying that things can change. Which is what sexual democracy is about. That is basically, sexual democracy says, even sex, whether it be gender or sexuality, even sex is subject to change and is open to debate. There's history and there's politics. What the Catholic Church did is that it sort of revived an argument in support of this um, anti-sexual democracy movement uh, based on the idea of nature. The insistence that the laws of nature were in fact natural law. Natural law, used by philosophers and used by theologians alike, uh, natural law had nothing to do with biological laws. But that's what it has become in Vatican theology in the years 2000. Uh, and, and I will not develop this because uh, my perverseness will be uh, made visible. Uh, but but the, the, if you're interested, I, I, I'll be happy to go back to, to uh, declarations of the Pope on, on the rainforests of marriage, uh, of heterosexual marriage that have to be preserved, which shows a very pessimistic view of heterosexuality. Mm -hmm. um, because rainforests are not going well. <laughs> and they will not be going well after the recent elections. And so clearly the book is worried about heterosexuality. Um, and so it's not reassuring. Uh, now, if we uh, think of this, what we see is that uh, the Catholic Church started building in the 1990s and even more in the years 2000 with a series of publications such as the uh, lexicon that was published first in Italian and then in French on, on the vocabulary of um, sex and family, etc. Uh, the, the Catholic Church started building an argument and there was more or less a theological argument based on nature, on the idea that there's something that you can change. And you can see that it's the exact opposite of the argument of sexual democracy. Sexual democracy says everything is up for change, everything is potentially political, and what the Vatican was saying is not everything. Why should the Vatican care so much about sex? Well, there are different reasons, but one of the reasons is that precisely it's about a transcendent definition of a social order versus an imminent definition. If there is no transcendent definition of the sexual order, that means that there's no role in society for the church to tell people what to do. And it's one thing not to tell people what to do in terms of premarital sex or uh, divorce or whatever, but if even the very fact of nature uh, escapes any transcendent definition, that raises a question which is, what is the transcendent role of the Catholic Church? So I think that's why, in addition to other reasons that have to do with the sexual organization of the Catholic Church that we'll not get into now, uh, that's one reason, one fundamental reason why the Church, the Catholic Church, cares so much about sex. It's about transcendence and about nature as the last refuge of transcendence. Now, if we think of this Catholic uh, version, what is striking is the importance it has gained. Because in France, if you compare with the late 1990s, the religious references were nearly absent. They became prominent in the years 2010. And this uh, is, for me, a way to move on to the next moment that we're in. I have described this moment of sexual democracy questioning norms, and then the co-optation of sexual democracy in the logic of, of the clash the sexual class and I have described this sort of 
more or less parallel moment uh, with the Catholic Church insisting on this sort of natural transcendent definition of, of sex. Now what I think is interesting is that what we've seen in the last few years is how much this is not just about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church in many ways has developed the arguments and they're available for all to use. But what we have seen, even in France, is that the Catholic Church can make alliances with Jews, with Muslims at times, uh, with all kinds of others, but more interestingly, with secular politicians who had no interest whatsoever in religion. How did they do it? Well, because of nature. Then nature was an argument that could be used not only by religious people, but also by everyone. Basically, nature, defined as that which is outside of history and politics, or basically non-history, non-politics, nature uh, could be the basis for alliances far beyond people who might have been interested in natural law. Natural law, few people care about. Nature, the laws of nature, everyone cares about. And for good reasons, because in fact, uh, the way uh, the sexual politics of the right have functioned is that it relies on the fact that we all have something to say about this, because it speaks to us, it's in our bodies. So no one is indifferent to these issues. We may relate very differently to this. We don't all agree on what to do with it, but no one is indifferent. So we've shifted from complete indifference to this absurd thing to a fascination for this thing because it's so powerful politically uh, to be able to mobilize people's uh, affects and people's bodies and people's um, not just rational thinking, but also their gut reactions. Hence the political importance of sex, not just for the Vatican, but for everyone. And this is what I want to point out. It's not just about these religions that I have mentioned. It can be in Russia with uh, an Orthodox version of Christianity. It can be with evangelicals uh, in the US or in Brazil, or it can be with all kinds of religions, but also it doesn't have to be through religion. It can work in all kinds of contexts. And this is something that I think is important and that we have a hard time fully grasping. That is, how come it spreads this sort of anti-gender theory, this anti-gender ideology of uh, discourse? How come it spreads so widely? One of the ways it functions is not just because it grabs us in our bodies, but also because it's vague enough that it can be used and appropriated by many for different reasons. And one of the ways in which it has functioned, if you look, for example, at the, the battle in the French context, the, the favorite phrase has been théorie du genre, the theory of gender. Whereas in other countries, it's been mostly the ideology of gender. Why speak about theory? Well, because theory is a way to say, first, I will speak as a rationalist, and I will say this is only a theory, so it's not true. First argument. You may not be fully convinced, and I am not either, because theories are what science is about, but basically the idea that it's a theory, therefore it's not true, is probably familiar in the US with all the discussions about Darwin. It's just a theory, so it's one theory among others. So this kind of rhetoric has been used in the case of gender. It's just a theory, meaning it's not true. First thing, so that's from a rationalist perspective. And that's why you have attacks today, uh, for example, on the hoax that was uh, accomplished in, in uh, American um, academic journals uh, with articles that were supposed to be fake and that worked, and, and so apparently that proves that it's fake science. So apart from the discussion of how true, untrue, etc., it is, but what is interesting is the rational standpoint, first part. But the second part is if you use the name of a group that was anti-gay marriage in France, le sens commun, common sense. Common sense is very powerful when you're talking about theory. You think, oh, yeah, there are all these highbrow people in universities talking about gender. I don't understand anything about what they're saying because they're so remote from reality. Uh, in fact, they have nothing to do with the real people. 
of the real people in the streets, and this is an argument that is used constantly in politics, and in particular in populist politics. Uh, the idea that it's obscure, it's um, theoretical, it's intellectual, it's not real people like us. So, as you can see, it's the opposite of the first argument. The first argument was the authority of reason, and the second one is the authority of common sense. The advantage of this contradiction is that it always works, one way or the other. Uh, you can always play with that, and you will end up with something that works. So I think the very phrase, theory of gender, is important. I mean, it's not the only one. Ideology of gender is important as well, because it resonates uh, with the comparison that, that was made uh, between gender ideology and Marxist ideology as the twin perils uh, that, that have threatened uh, the West. But, but I want to focus on theory, because I think the word theory hasn't been fully grasped as a politically efficient instrument in, in these battles. Now, I, I want to conclude uh, very soon, and so I will not take very long, but I think if we want to understand how it circulates widely, we have to understand how different groups of people can use this rhetoric without having to make efforts to be consistent. It doesn't matter. Uh, so we should not assume that there's a very rigorous ideological position to be defended. In fact, it's people who think, well, we talk too much about women, and we talk too much about sexual minorities, etc. So it's it's not a very elaborate argument. It's just I'm sick and tired of all this, um, which which is much more powerful than elaborate arguments. Uh, so resentment, I think, is fundamental in this. And focusing the resentment on something that has to do with the good old traditional order, we can see why sexual democracy is very much central to these battles because sexual democracy says things can change. They're subjected to history, and they're subjected to politics. So for people who say, enough change, we want to go back to something, the fantasy of the past, obviously, uh, or nature, uh, obviously, sexual democracy is dangerous. Now, I, I want to, to conclude uh, with a few remarks. The first one is that what I have tried to describe is the moving ground. That is, I have insisted, as I always do, on the fact that we're not talking about things that are stable, that keep changing. And in fact, that's why talking about activity for me is so important, because the story keeps unfolding. Uh, it, and it's never exactly the same story. Uh, and the example that I took about all of a sudden you use a certain argument and it ends up meaning something altogether different because the context has changed, for me is fundamental. We always have to think not just as social scientists, but also as people interested in activist work, we have to think contextually. We cannot ignore and sort of be above the context when we're caught in it. That's the, the first thing. The second thing is uh, the, the fact that um, it is important to me to, to, to insist on the fact that uh, we do not need to think of a theoretical coherence uh, in these debates. In fact, these are arguments, and arguments that are meant to be efficient. They're not meant to be coherent. Well, coherence is basically a concern when you're presenting a talk, and, and so if you tell me that I'm not coherent, I will feel bad. If you tell people who are trying to win a political battle that you are not coherent, if they won, they don't care. Uh, and, and I think that's something we should always bear in mind, is that the, the, the importance of coherence is as Mbote would have said, it's a sort of um, academic bias. Uh, the third uh, remark that I want to make is the possibility of circulation among different groups. Uh, I think we should not assume uh, that we're talking about one group or another. We can sort of move constantly from one group to another. And uh, the fourth and last remark that I want to make is that I have insisted mostly on discourses that are basically weighing on our shoulders. At the same time, uh, I think we should not minimize, even though that's what I have done in some ways, the fact that people who speak about gender are not just uh, determined by all this, I mean, they participate in this, they change all uh, the nature of the discussion, at least somewhat. 
Uh, and, and I think uh, this is um, also a point that, that I feel we should take seriously, that if we, we tend to minimize the, uh, the role that we can play in this, because of course we know that most people don't care about academia and all that, but the very fact that the word gender is so successful is an indication that we may underestimate at times uh, the impact of academic work. And so we should take this as an example of the fact that it matters. And the proof that it matters is that so many people hate us. Uh, that's a very encouraging sign. Again, it started from the radical indifference of many people, the condescension. Now, people are hostile. People want to kill people who do gender. Uh, and, and I think quite literally, uh, we should take this as an encouragement, because in fact, we do hope to say something that people do not all agree upon. I don't think that the point of doing gender studies is to say, we're going to say something consensual. The idea is to change something. It's not to have everyone on our side. And I think this goes to, and I'll conclude with that, with the <coughs> other meaning of democracy. Um, the one that I have left out from the start, but which has become so central in the discussions today, when you talk about Hungary, when you, we talk about Brazil, etc., all that is happening in different countries, what we see is that today, gender is not just about gender. Sexual democracy is not just about sexual democracy, it's about democracy. What is going on in Brazil, I think, is a very clear indication of that. What is going on in, in Hungary, what is going on in the US, what is going on in many countries, I think, is what's at stake when people talk about gender today? It's not just sexual democracy, it's democracy. And that's why I feel that since we should not underestimate the role of academics in all this, well, that's why I, I have uh, participated in launching this uh, uh, international network uh, in defense of gender studies that is supposed to uh, spread information about what is going on in different countries, but also to mobilize people to lobby, um, which is a bad word in French, which I still use. Uh, so it, it's an academic network, which I am very proud of. Uh, that has been named um, the Gender International L'Internationale du Genre, uh, which sounds ominous enough, I hope, uh, as a conclusion. Thank you very much. Language anthropologists working on reproduction who insisted on the change that it represented. She insisted on the fact don't panic, there's nothing new. Uh, I summarized her argument, but, but I don't think I distorted it radically. Conversely, briefly, at the time of Pax, at a certain moment she said, No, it's so new that we can't do it. But this is the same logic. The logic is the reason why we can do it is because it's not new. Fundamentally, it looks new, but it isn't. Um, then the difficulty that she has is, and which is not specific to her, is how to make this into a political argument. Because how can you make an argument for change if you insist on the fact that things don't change? Um, in the case of Bourdieu, and, and I've been quick on this, but the very way the work, the, the book on masculine domination is structured, uh, it's using ethnographic material from his work in Algeria, uh, with the Kabyles in the, around 1960 or something like that. Uh, and sort of saying this is a mirror uh, that makes more visible what is going on today. Basically says, sure it's changed a little bit, but the bottom line is that between rural Algeria, 
in the 1950s and urban France of around 2000, the difference is not an essential difference. It's a difference of degree. And so we can use one to explain the other. So I think, and this was not meant as a disparaging comment on either, but I think that's one of the strategies for thinking about national domination, about patriarchy, etc., is to insist on the fact that appearances notwithstanding, it's still the same object, it's still the same thing. Uh, I find that it's useful to think both of the fact that there's always masculine domination, uh, but that the forms vary. And that's the kind of argument that, that I try to make. That's a good start. Mild or mildly expressed disagreement on the second row. Maybe not mildly disagreement, but mildly expressed for the moment. Hi. Um, so, as you said before, when we talked about the us versus them dynamic that's at play in a lot of countries right now, um, a country like France is relying on sexual democracy and its like acceptance of LGBTQ rights as a foil to um, non-Western country and framing them as like the liberal other that does not respect LGBTQ rights. And so this is particularly at play in the, the refugee crisis in France right now where refugees are framed as a them that are homophobic and do not believe in the rights of LGBTQ people. Uh, and so I'd like to get your insight on this paradox I've noticed in France where there's this conversation of sexual democracy versus the liberal other, but at the same time, LGBTQ refugees are really struggling to get asylum, actually, in France. And so I was wondering if, I, don't, I think it's a complicated question, with maybe no answers or love answers, but what was your, what were your thoughts on this paradox at play right now in French politics? Well, first, it, it's more in French policies than French politics, in the sense that, as far as I can tell, it's not a part of the general conversation. But it's, those of us who are interested in the subject know about this, but I think most people haven't followed the fact that you know, one way to get into France is to be gay. Uh, so I think it's policy, and, and the way it works with the administration, with the judges, with the etc. Um, and as you know, uh, it's not just in Europe, but in Europe, oh, there was a 2004 um, new, um, I forget how it's directive or whatever it's called, uh, and, and that includes for asylum seekers the category of uh, sexual persecution. And so it means that for the first time, uh, it's become a good deal to be gay, or to be a lesbian, up to a point. Uh, that is, that for the first time, people can be accused of pretending to be gay, or it be all the time. Uh, that is, things have turned around. That is, instead of, sort of uh, suspecting people of being closeted gays and lesbians, now people are suspected of being closeted heterosexuals. Um, this is quite a radical change. In practice, it doesn't mean that the state has become pro-gay. It just means that it's supposed to be pro-gay. But the bottom line is that the state, whatever that means, is not interested in letting people in. It's interested in justifying the fact that we're dealing nicely with people. But not, I mean, the point is not to let in more people. For example, when Nicolas Sarkozy at one point said that we would welcome to France all the women who are victims of violence in the world, that did not happen. Um, and you could sort of anticipate that it would not happen, uh, even before he finished his sentence. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be taken literally. What it means is that it creates a situation where basically the state wants to claim that one reason why we have all these policies is because we're democratic countries, and therefore we want to preserve sexual democracy, and therefore we want to protect sexual minorities who are persecuted. But on the other hand, we'd rather have as few as possible migrants. And France has been quite good at refusing people. Uh, so how do you do it? Well, you say, are you sure they're really gay? And, and then there's the question of proving that you're gay. Uh, 
and, and quite a few people have started working on this in the last few years. Uh, and, and for example, if you're interested, uh, there, there's a new research project that was uh, started by uh, Daniel Boyu, the big old scholar, uh, with a different sort of law on this issue and there are others. So, the, the question then is, is it, it raises a sort of contradiction, which I think is interesting for everyone. I mean, which is very painful for the people who have to go through this, obviously, oh, and, and very humiliating, etc. But, but which is interesting to think about theoretically, because on the one hand, one way to think about it is the sort of liberal discourse that says we are, uh, we in the West are sort of liberated, and so gays, let's say gays who come to France uh, can finally be gays. So they, they can be themselves. They can be genuinely gay by moving to the West or to the North or to France or whatever. Uh, and the, the critique of this has been, no, no, in fact, gay and girls from the left were imposing upon them a true uh, sort of Western gay identity. And so you have the two symmetrical versions. One which is very optimistic and so great, and the other that, that sort of points out uh, we were sort of preventing them from being what they are in their own culture, etc. What I think it reveals is, in fact, uh, that sexual identity um, is not something that is defined as true. Uh, it's neither true uh, at the, in the country of origin nor true in the country of destination. It's always something that is negotiated in context. And so, in a plurality of contexts. And, and so, I've, I've written with another SSE on this and, and uh, insisting on the fact that we, we could use Foucault's argument about the device sex, uh, the true sex, uh, of his preface to Daphne Bauman. Uh, we could use that to think of this imposition of truth as if there were a truth of sexual identity that pre exists politics, that pre exists the role of the state, that pre exists uh, policies uh, that are taking place. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's caught up in all these discussions, but we can turn it around to use it as a critical tool to think about both. Foresee the way they're 
Williams and women and all sorts of juridical decisions given the way the courts are being stacked right now by Trump. And we can begin to see that public opinion is actually up for grabs more than it seems just a couple of years ago. Or to take Eastern Europe, where gender was so important in the Catholic Church's opposition to Soviet domination that one of the arguments they made was about the way communism undermined the family, destroyed gender roles, made women drive tractors in the fields, etc., etc. And then in the more recent period, the way gender and sexual politics, but especially sexual politics, gay rights, have been the leading edge of Eastern European opposition to the European Union and to the sense of loss of national sovereignty and control, self-definition um, against this now Western-based power. I, I don't think there's any global explanation in this very complex world we have, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about how you see the link between anti-gender politics and nationalist politics playing out in different societies today. Well, first, uh, the way it works, I think, is that the internationalization works hand in hand with the nationalization. Because on the one hand, it's become about Frenchness, it's become about Americanness, etc., etc. Et and at the same time, it circulates widely. So arguments can be borrowed from one country to the next. You have people traveling to sort of share the stuff and all that. So the internationalization, it's not in opposition to the nationalization. Uh, I think that's that's the, the first thing that I would say. The second thing is that when, when we organized that conference on sexual nationalisms, at the time it was with the instrumentalization, the co-optation of gender and sexuality, uh, of sexual democracy, etc., uh, for racist and xenophobic purposes. Now the same thing can be turned around. And that's what, to me, is so interesting, is that basically it can work one way or the other, and with the same people. My experience, in particular participating in public debates, is that if you live long enough, you'll have the same people telling you, I mean, I, I've, I've seen people on all kinds of issues, but in particular on gender and sexual politics, sort of, uh, um, changing their minds in remarkable ways. Uh, and, and for example, the very same people who are criticizing American style of feminism uh, in the 1990s, of insisting that basically talking about gender was foreign to French culture. The very same people in the years 2000 said that feminism was essential to the French nation, that France by nature was essentially feminist. It seemed historically debatable, but, but politically it became very efficient. Um, and, and I think um, that, that's the second point that I want to emphasize is that it can turn around. At the moment, it's the whiteness part that counts. But it was already the whiteness part of in the years 2000, except that it was a different kind of whiteness. It was the sexual democratic whiteness in the years 2000, and today it's the sexual reactionary whiteness. So what is interesting for me is the possibility of rapid change, uh, which goes largely unnoticed. That's because we're cut out in the present, uh, or we forget that it's actually that is the present that is moving. Uh, and, and so the nation, for me, is very indication of that. If you take one example of how it can happen in a few months, uh, the discourse that I mentioned in 2007 by Nicolas Sarkozy about national identity being not about racist ethnic principles, but about really Republican principles such as the freedom of movement, etc. Six months later, he was visiting the Vatican and insisting on the fact that basically there was this place it was, it was shared by the Vatican and by France and all that, and at that time he had completely given up on any kind of a modern version of sexual democracy, and he had converted within six months. We could think that it's specific to, to Sarkozy, I believe not. I think that in some ways what is interesting is the, the fact that political discourse can change so quickly because basically people don't mind as long as basically but the common link is whiteness, uh, what he's doing one or the other. It can be Republican whiteness, or it can be um, reactionary uh, whiteness. You can still call it Republican. So I, I think, for me, the, the, the volatile nature of rhetoric is what is most striking. So you can always use the nation, but you can change the way you use it within six months, and 
no one cares. I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you also uh, on this question of um, your second point on this idea of the, the, that the, the anti-gender movement has no theoretical coherence. So I mean, I'm with you on that point because it's it's true that they're presenting the they're presenting the theory of gender as if there was a coherence that is obviously comes to stand for all kinds of things: Marxism, nihilism, postmodernism, um, feminism. But still. The thing, you know, what I'm, what, I, what I'm having a hard time understanding is why this particular language of the theory of gender would appeal to such different contexts without taking the theory seriously. Because it seems to me that in France you could say, okay, well, France has always had a kind of interest in these kind of abstract theoretical languages. We saw it with the Louis Strauss and Lacan, or, you know, so the theory of gender could be kind of a mask. But the fact that this, that you know, the peace agreement in Colombia is defeated, and people are voting uh, no, saying that this peace agreement was inspired by the wars of Joe Scott and Judith Butler, um, that it's in Hungary, that it's in Brazil, that it's so. It's like how do we, and, and as you said, I mean, extremely difficult theories at the end of the day. So why catalyze this debate on these extremely complex? Philosophies that are not so. I mean, this is the part that's hard to, for me to figure out. Is it just a kind of sociological spread of these? I mean, who is doing the reading of Judith Butler, and who is, you know, well, you don't need to read her, but why use that language? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think. I mean, and I'll partially repeat stuff that I've said, hopefully in more interesting way. But the well, first, because. Not about the theoretical part, but about why sex matters, because that was my question. Why should people care so much about sex? And, and the, the answer was different for the Catholic Church, and for different, but why should many people care about sex? Because politically, it's a very potent language. Uh, and it's a very potent language because basically everyone has a body. Uh, and because basically everyone feels that when you hear about men and women, when you hear about sex and about what it is to desire or not to desire this person, that person, whatever, everyone feels this is about me. So basically when the, the critique against political discourse is that it's abstract, that it's too far from real people. If you talk about money, I mean, you know that if you're talking to people, they know what you're talking about. It doesn't mean they have to understand the rate or whatever, but there's nothing that we, I mean, as a, as a political language, oh, I think it's very powerful. Oh, that's the first part of the answer. The, the second part, why this complicated stuff? Why Joey Butler? Oh, because it's complicated. Oh, precisely, I think that's fundamental. Oh, when people start attacking gender as being this theory of uh, Jewish lesbian feminists. As you know, the racial part is as important as, as the sexual part. What are they doing? The, the Jewish part that says basically it's cosmopolitan, it's not in the nation, etc. Uh, but also, it's also very complicated. Uh, so, on the one hand, it's very complicated means it's not rational and it's not common sense. And the two together are very powerful. And it has to do with the status of politics in our society today, which is not specific to that. I mean, basically, the idea that the, the authority of abstract politics is eroding constantly, etc. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, the, the, on the one hand, why should sex matter? Well, because it matters to people. And that's one way of talking to people and being sure. I mean, if, let's say if I arrive and I say I'm going to talk about sex tonight. I'm more likely to grab your interest than if I say I'm going to talk about immigration. That's the way it works. I mean, I, I've used that uh, once when teaching, uh, and when I was invited to participate in something where I had nothing to say about sex, and students were falling asleep, and, and so I said I'm going to talk about sex. They woke up, and they did, uh, but it worked. So basically, that I mean, everyone feels, yeah, it's about me, it's about my life, it's about the real person that I am. Um, but also, why complicated stuff about gender? Because complicated is not like us. Because we're sick and tired of these abstract things. We just want real stuff. And that, I think, has to do with the state of politics today.
Yeah. We have time maybe for two more, two last questions. Sorry, um, well, I think my question is kind of related to the last one. Um, I've been thinking a lot about sort of the state of op-eds and pieces that have been written in the past week or so in response to Trump's attempt to kind of codify a, a sexual binary. And in the question of sort of how the right likes to parse the theoretical from the supposedly real return to the body as evidence, a lot of pieces that are against these policies are kind of doing from a left perspective the same. So they're saying, wait a minute, if you look at biological sex, it's not often a binary there are many uh, you know, ways that chromosomes can be in between. And I'm just wondering what you think of this as a kind of strategy of argumentation. Um, you spoke a lot about sort of the portability of language and how it can be used by uh, people sort of of many different political opinions and that they can also change the language they're using. So I'm just curious if this, a few things is an effective, I mean that's a big that's question, but I'm curious. That's a good idea on the part of the time. I was just struggling to write an op-ed in the New York Times. Sure. I think basically all of us do what we can do, uh, given the, what we know how to do, etc. So, and, and I, I don't mean that in a negative way at all. I just think that basically Anne Francois Sterling is right to do what she knows how to do. That is, she knows how sex works. Uh, and she can tell it because she's been working with this for a long time in a relatively simple way, complicated enough that people end up thinking, that when you read the op-ed, in the end you think, yes, I understand, but what was it exactly? You don't remember, so you, you know it's science. <laughs> That's a bright of science. And, and again, I don't, I mean, I, I say this with admiration. I, I don't say that in a sort of sarcastic way. Um, you remember, first, that she knows what she's saying. Second, that it's complicated. And third, that common sense will not do. I'm not saying that's the only strategy. But, uh, and, and we always have to wonder uh, about what is it what should we discuss, what should we not discuss, etc. For example, there was a debate, uh, including on the list of people from this gender international, should we start responding to the hoax of thing? You know, these articles published in academic journal on the left. And, and I think most of us felt we should not enter that debate, uh, because basically that means there's a debate. And, and but at the same time, I sometimes wonder when I see that I'm attacked every single day on Twitter uh, because I, I'm a fake scientist, uh, because whatever I say has been discredited forever and a day by, by these publications. So I think, hmm, maybe I should. So, I don't know. Uh, basically, in this context, uh, I do feel that you know, most of us are not winning this battle. Uh, and therefore, apparently, we're not doing the best thing that we could do. Um, so we're all thinking about strategies and thinking what's a better way to do it. I, I don't have a clear answer to that, except that we, we cannot, I believe, fight on the same ground as the people who attack us. Because basically, Say Twitter, you cannot insult people as much as they insult you. It's not a winning game. Last question. I'm not an academic, so excuse me, but um, this Uber mastermind that seems to be coming from the right, as I remember in my fairy tales, even in Victorian England, the masculine was to protect the children and the wife. They have no interest in protecting the feminine either in certainly the feminine in the gay world, but the feminine at all, the way Christina Ford was attacked. What kind of new masculinity is this new uber masculine? Well, it's not my personal ideal, <laughs> um, but, uh, to, to put it simply, but uh, clearly it's not just about masculinity, because it's simultaneously about race and about whiteness. Um, and it's about class in complicated ways. It's about feeling that you're not part of the elites even when you are. Uh, and, and so it plays on different things. Uh, to me, it's a culture of resentment. Right? But to me, that's the, the bottom line. Uh, it's sort of uh, a pro 
paraphrasing uh, arguments that have been developed on the left about discrimination by minorities and in the same way that the Catholic Church in France claims to be a minority today. Uh, minority culture, etc. Um, but the only unprotected minority, etc. And white men as well. White men are the only unprotected minority, etc. etc. Um, that to me is the culture of resentment. So it's not presented as an ideal, because what you're saying is basically um, sort of happy version of masculinity. Uh, that is basically the idea that uh, being a man means uh, being top of the world. Basically, the main argument of those who will end up uh, killing people in schools or, or killing people in synagogues and all that, etc., is we're losing. So it's it's a very paradoxical way of uh, defining masculinity. Uh, masculinity as the, the province of losers uh, and as a way of winning. So that's, that's to me is the contemporary paradox. Thank you, Eric. Uh, please join me in welcome. Thank you, Eric, for tonight's talk.